Good morning, everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Chris Bates, and it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much for the invite. Um, I'm the head of informatics and analytics at a, a company called TPP. We are an EHR vendor based in the UK, uh, but we've been working here in, in the kingdom for about three years um, closely with the Ministry of Health around primary care, and that's something I'll talk a little bit about later on. And I'm also um, a research fellow in health informatics at the University of Leeds in the UK. And the University of Leeds and, and King Saud University here, and actually a, a wider across Riyadh, have started to build a really good relationship uh, in health informatics. That's started with a training programme, but we're also delighted um, to have Suleiman Almran, who was introducing um, some of the talks yesterday, who's come to the UK to do his fascinating PhD. Uh, and it's great to be part of that work as one of the supervisors. So it's a, a really interesting partnership that we're hoping we can, we can build on from there. And I want to talk to you today about health informatics, uh, primary care going towards population health, uh, and, and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and, and the opportunities. And I'll talk about those things in, in three phases, starting with um, health informatics. And a few months ago, I was in an airport in London. I was in Heathrow Airport, and I was chatting to a guy sitting next to me, and he was a a bright, intelligent, smart guy, and he was clearly interested in, in, in lots of diverse things, and he was interested in, in what I did for a living. And I said I was in health informatics, specifically in health IT and in, and in uh, EHRs. And he said to me, oh, I, so what have you been doing? I said, oh, I've been talking at an event. And he said, oh, well, you, I presume you're talking about hospital servers and software and coding and standards and schemas and APIs and what databases work and what mobile solutions we should be using for people. And, and it really resonated with me because... That's exactly what health informatics is not. It's not about those things. It's about um, a different thing, and we utilize those technologies. So if that's not what it is, I just want to tell you what my premise is for what it is. And my favorite definition comes from a guy called David Penniman, who used to be dean of the School of Informatics at the University of Buffalo in the US. And he defines it as the, the intersection between information and technology and people, which I, I really, really like. And so for healthcare, it's that intersection applied to solving problems in health. So how can we use those things, technology information, the data, and the people around it to help improve patient outcomes and improve the way we, we change service delivery? And to do that, I want to take you back. And uh, Dr. Al Yamani yesterday told us, of course, that health informatics as a term was coined in, in 1976 um, when computers started to become more paramount in hospitals and healthcare settings. But with that broader definition, you can go a long way back. And I want to do that because it really gives us some context into the, what, this, um, what this conference is about, those emerging technologies and emerging trends, but that it's not a new concept, that we've just got to apply those three things to make it happen. So I want to take you back quickly to the, the Crimea in 1854 and to inner city London in the same year. And they were a really interesting time for us as, as health informaticians. And the problems we're trying to solve, and we've always got to remember the problem we are trying to solve, and the problem then was exceptionally low life expectancy. We had life expectancy in the UK of about 40, so people were just not, not getting into what we'd now class as middle age, and terrible infant, in, infant mortality rates. So in areas in some reports, there was half of the children uh, that, were, that were being born were not making it to the age of one because of endemic and epidemic disease. And they were the problems, and they weren't new problems. I mean, the, the, the low life expectancy was terrible, um, at the battlefront, but that wasn't new to people. We knew that. But what was interesting was this is the first time we started to get media, and this is uh, to uh, Professor Moafa's point yesterday, that we'd started to get newspapers and people had started to understand information. So people now understood what was going on, and as, as Moafa said, media and social media now can really change the way that, it can really elicit strong emotions in people, and there was a public outcry into these things, which made the government act. So against that backdrop, the British government sent out, uh, sent out a team of nurses uh, headed by Florence Nightingale. There was 38 nurses that were put together to go out and care for the troops. And, and when they got there, they did what every good informatician should do and what every good analyst would do. They tried to get out onto the wards and they tried to get out and do some, some actual on the ground. What were the problems? What was going on? How can we start to solve them? Rather than just sitting back and trying to guess what the problems were. And again, like every good analyst and every good informatician knows, they ran into bureaucracy. They, could, they couldn't get on the water. It was very difficult for them to do that. But they persevered. And for the purposes of our story, what they did, which was brilliantly important, was they started to take meticulous notes about the patients and about the soldiers. So they were taking notes about their condition, about their 
nutrition status, about their cause of death, and accurate recording these for all the patients, which was absolutely incredible and hadn't really happened before. And they were published. Um, just get, let me get the name because it's interesting. She published them, Florence Nightingale, on notes and matter, on matters affecting health efficiency and hospital administration, which is an incredibly contemporary title and feels like it should be or could be one of the posters next door that we've been seeing. But it wasn't the fact that she just published those notes, it was the way that she published them. So this is the modern day equivalent of how you communicate with chief executives of hospitals, how you communicate with ministers. They don't want to see lists of tables, they don't want to see notes, they want to see the thing they can make a decision on very quickly. And in this diagram that she, she invented, but it's very, very powerful today, the blue wedges represent preventable disease. So these weren't soldiers that were dying in battle, these were soldiers that were dying in a preventable way. So it's really damning, the evidence is damning there that that's the problem. And what they also discovered from that data, using that information, that it wasn't a lack of supplies. It had been thought that it was a lack of medication. And actually the medication of the day was arsenic and mercury and opiates in some, in some mix. And unsurprisingly to us now, that was killing more people than it was saving. But that wasn't the problem. The problem that came out of the data and came out of that analysis was that it was sanitation and cleanliness. So they introduced that and we have a, 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 you know, the legacy of a far better disease control. What Florence Nightingale needed to do that was accurate causes of death. She needed to be able to record that information properly to do the analysis. And in exactly the same year, and a, a, a friend of hers back in the UK was this man, and this, was, this is William Farr, who we again got a mention yesterday. And William Farr was compiling his international list of causes of disease. He, he realised how important it was that we had a coding system to be able to do this. This is standard for us now, but it was pioneering really at the time to, to think in, in that breadth. And it depends how well you know your ICD-10 codes, um, but Professor Syed here will be very upset if you don't. He was very passionate about it yesterday. But you will recognise some of those. So that was, this is the direct parent of the ICD-10 codes that we use a lot today for hospital analysis, for, for our causes of death, for our mortality statistics, and to make policy decisions. So he compiled those. Just as interesting, at the same, exactly the same time, William Farr was arguing with this, this man, and this is Jon Snow, and this brings us right back to that inner city London thing, the, the second uh, of our problems to talk about, where infant mortality rates were terrible and people were dying, and it was because of a cholera ep epidemic. And again, because of the pressures of media, it started to take some real hold with people, and they wanted the problem solved. And again, John Snow was taking meticulous notes and doing meticulous work to work out what the problems were and could we solve them. And here's his visualisation. Again, we're seeing real patterns, an emerging trend that we need to be able to visualise these things. And in the middle there, you can see the pump and the visualisation next to it is a long bar. And this was the number of deaths. And John Snow had worked out that all the deaths were, were, were around this one water pump that people were using to get water for the house, giving real strong evidence to the fact that this was a waterborne problem. William Farr disagreed. He thought it was the air vapours coming up. He thought that it was noxious gases coming up from the River Thames. And that's what was killing people. And he as well was starting to take really, really accurate data representations and, and to try to understand the problem. And again, he's visualised it beautifully. So on the horizontal axis there, that's the number of deaths. And on the vertical axis, that's how high people lived. So that was the altitude people were living at. And his hypothesis was that the, 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 the bad air with the, the, the cholera causing agent in wasn't getting high enough. And the problem was that it was, in, it was in the air. And he was wrong, as it turned out, because he hadn't taken account for the fact that a lot of those people were living around that pump. So snow was right. And in one of the, probably the greatest public health uh, intervention of all time that we all know a lot about, he just removed the handle from the pump. It wasn't the most technological intervention of all time, but stopped people using that water pump and the cholera epidemic started to, to subside and we'd realised that this was a waterborne problem and we needed, again, sanitation to fix it. Far as well, in exactly the same year, um, was talking to this guy, and this is Charles Babbage, and if, for those of you who are involved in computer science, you may know that Charles Babbage is... Uh, the father of the computer. So modern computer design comes from Babbage. He, he invented it. And at the time, he was putting forward his ideas of what was called the difference engine. And this was uh, an engine which would do calculations which were beyond the feasible scope of, of somebody doing it manually. And the reason he was interested is that he had a data set. His causes of death data set had 6.5 million rows in it, which is a big, big data set for then. This is 1854. And it's still a pretty big data set for now. And he knew that if he wanted to do calculations, he needed something different. So he needed 
the modern computer. And so he bought this. This is the difference engine. If you're in London, you can go see this. Uh, it's still in one of our museums. This is difference engine number two that he bought for £1,200, so about um, 7,000 rials back in 1854 to do this work for him. And he started to put the data he'd got on cause of death through a computer. So this is, this is the birth of health informatics. And here you go, there's a real table. That's just number crunching. So this is exactly what the machine pumped out. And it enabled him to, to have accurate predictions of where, in different communities across the country, what the life expectancy was, what the cause of death was expected to be. And this has resonated right through to the life tables we, we can still get from the World Health Organization today. And you can log on to the website now and download them. So there you are. This was the real, really is it. This was, this was information, technology, and people coming together. So the information, collecting meticulous records from cases, really starting to do that, being able to code it properly because we'd started to get classifications, using emerging technologies, certainly the difference engine, to do those calculations, and a wide range of people involved, so doctors, nurses, uh, statisticians, epidemiologists. And what was the legacy of this? Well, the legacy um, to healthcare has been enormous. It's, it, it's the invention of modern-day nursing. Um, it's the invention of infection control. Uh, you know, huge patient safety incident that we, we, we talked about yesterday is trying to, to control infection, but the way we do that was born here. It's the invention of hospice care, um, and it's a remarkable achievement, a really remarkable achievement. And amongst other things, all those people were informaticians. They were the sort of inspiration we should be using today um, to look at when we're trying to look at what may emerge. So fast forward to now. Um, I've got three graphs here, in, from, one from 1910, one from 1960, and one from 2010. And it's about, this is about life expectancy and, and infant mortality, the two problems we were talking about. And if you look, the progress we've made, so on the, on, again, on the horizontal axis, that's, that's life expectancy, and on the um, vertical axis is, is infant mortality. So we can see the shift in that time towards the bottom right-hand corner. We've still some work to do on the far right there in, in the African continent. But if you look across the Gulf and across Europe, we're very much in the same space in that life expectancy has become uh, immeasurably better and our infant mortality rates have dropped. And, and a good chunk of that is because of the work we've been talking about. Antibiotics, of course, came in, but that was about 1950, and, and germ theory was, was some, several years after the work of Nightingale and Farr. But that's where we are. So this has lent to new problems that we need to solve. So let's, I just want to look at the, the same sort of analysis as to what are the problems we have now. And my colleague, Justin Keane, at the University of Leeds, uh, who's a professor there, has a wonderful paper called What is a Care Pathway? And at the start of that paper, he summarises a lot of the modern-day problems, the things we always end up talking about at conferences like this and, and healthcare conferences about long-term conditions and, and NCDs and, and how we can help creaking health economies uh, to actually deal with the, the scale of change of this problem. And they, they break down into two nice categories, and these are the problem's ideas. And the first one is that service delivery is becoming ever more complex. Uh, we would all agree on that and that health systems need to manage risk proactively. The, the days of a hospital managing things reactively have absolutely gone. We need to change our focus and look at stopping people getting too far down a care pathway, so getting them too far into a position where they will end up in hospital. And if we just look at the complexity, so first of all, we have disease complexity. This is drawn from the National Library of Medicine in the US and, and just gives some of the links, the, uh, the links between diseases um, uh, from clinical pathways, really, that we expect. And you can see how it started to get complex. And we mentioned again yesterday that we have got a, a serious rise in long-term conditions and non-communicable diseases. But probably more importantly is that there, we have a rise in the, in the links of these. So it's multimorbidity that's the problem. It's not that we've now got people, with just a lot more diabetic people. We've got a lot more diabetic people, if you look at the graph, who have hypertension, they have obesity, they suffer from myocardial infarction. So we, we, it's, those, it's those difficult care pathways that come together. And actually, sometimes we're treating one care pathway almost at the expense of another because of that complexity. And that complexity goes further. In the middle layer there, that's our disease network. So here's our obese diabetic patient that we want to, we want to try and solve. But there's a layer above that into family ties, social networks, um, the physical proximity of the patient to healthcare services. Are they living in a rural environment? Are they living in an urban environment? And it actually there's a great deal of research and a great deal of evidence that the local context of an intervention is exceptionally important. So if we want to make a simple biochemical, biomedical intervention in that middle layer to, to, to try and treat a disease state, we have to really worry about how that filters up. It becomes a complex social intervention because behaviour patterns of patients and communities don't act like they do in research settings when we've got it very well controlled. So when we move to putting that into genuine clinical practice, we really have to take into account the complexity at that layer. 
And our expanding medical knowledge, of course, breeds complexity itself. This is um, the diabetic uh, recommended, so this is NICE in the UK, the National Institute for Clinical Excellence, who put down a lot of standards for how we should be treating people. And this is the medication pathway for type 2 diabetics after lifestyle interventions have failed. So we've already gone through an enormously complex pathway just to get to this point. And this is difficult. And this is just for diabetes. So if you're a multimorbid patient, there's many, many of these. And the cognitive burden we place on clinicians trying to remember this is almost impossible. We have to be looking for new ways of doing it. We have to be looking for technology to help us solve these problems. And going back to risk, uh, how do we why do we need to manage risk proactively? I don't need to say a great deal about this. We all know about these, these problems. But here are some stats from um, the Lancet Global uh, Burden of Disease Study that they, they do every five or six years with the, with the World Health Organization which actually is very interesting because these are the descendants of those live tables. So there's a real connection to what we were talking about historically. But there's some interesting things here. If you look, this is the obesity, obesity graph. And if you look towards the 55, 60 year old males, that's where the problem is. So the bubble is coming. It's not that we are in the worst situation we can be in now. We've got these uh, older people who, well, more into middle age, who are starting to have these problems and are about to have a real impact. And if we go to tobacco, Smoking, so that's, if we're looking at smoking rates, again, you can see in this region, and, and it's the same across most of the world, we've got this real problem with younger adult, younger men smoking, which is going to have an enorm enormous impact on their health. And it's beyond just healthcare now, it's beyond the public health issue, because what we're seeing is that, that the, the years of life lost or the disability adjusted years of life lost for these people has started to come past the, beyond the working age. So we've started now that so these diseases start to have an impact on national economies because these younger people can't work up until uh, their, their full expected working age, so they're not generating as much income for the country. So there's a, a really interesting feedback loop that we need to address. So if we go back to our problems, that service delivery is becoming ever more complex and health systems need to, be managed, to manage risk proactively. So what's the solution? Well, again, with the theme of, the con of, of the, this conference, it's an emerging solution. And one of the emerging solutions for this is to look at population health systems. So it's a shift away um, from just thinking about individual care, but moving towards that population. And there's many definitions as you start to look around of, of a population health system. But this is a, an academically uh, accepted one that, from Stoddard in 2003, which says it's the health outcomes, we're looking at the health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of outcomes within the group. So not just focusing on individual people within the group and, and how they're moving, but trying to reduce those health inequalities across the group as well. There's an important shift. And this, a diagram from the King's Fund, um, in the UK are one of our leading uh, healthcare think tanks uh, internationally uh, have really started to, to look at this and what what does population health entail well it entails broader determinants of health so it's looking at of course our clinical interventions are hugely important but it's also saying we need to look for those um, environmental financial and social interventions because maybe that's the problem maybe our elderly person who's turning up with respiratory problems is turning up like that because they can't afford to put the heating on so actually we need to track further upstream and look for what the interesting intervention is so we have to have integrated care. We have to have coordination of care across services. As I've said, we're not going to manage this inside of hospitals. It needs to be across the piece. And we need to make every healthcare contact count for health promotion. So rather than just focusing on care services, absolutely encouraging health promotion at every contact, wherever that is across the healthcare estate. So if we drill into this and just look at the three layers of analysis for, for, for population health systems, at a macro layer, a meso layer, and a micro layer, well, all the examples, and there are some really good examples. Um, in the NHS, we're starting to see health and social care come together, not just operationally, but also financially. So they're sharing budgets for people. So an acknowledgement that we can't decouple someone's health from their social situation. Um, and in, in Germany, there's some great examples. And Kaiser um, in the US. Kaiser, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Kaiser pyramid, the risk pyramid, where They've, Kaiser's model was to take a lot of the data to, to look at the patients with long-term conditions to identify those at most risk of poor outcomes right at the top of that risk pyramid uh, and to treat those people. In the last uh, four or five years, that approach has changed and they're now taking the approach of let's using that data to tackle everybody they care for. So looking at people in different sections of the risk pyramid and saying what are the interventions that work for them, T using the data to be, to be prescriptive and to target those interventions to see what happens. And they've had some really good results. For, for, so for example, for smoking cessation, by targeting people based on their individual circumstances, they've seen a, a, a drop in smoking prevalence of about 25%. They're based mainly in California, and that's against a backdrop of about 7%. So it really is, it really is an interesting result. 
And all the examples we see have these things in common. At the macro level, they're using population level data to analyze healthcare trends and to track health. They're trying to get the community involved, so using community assets and using what's available and getting community involvement in designing services for what works for the people there. And they're expanding partners and services. So not trying to do this all centrally, but trying to expand across a range of different providers and making those providers accountable. Often these are set up as what, we, what are called accountable care organisations, so that actually the, the, the item of measure, unless you get good outcomes, then no one's getting funded across this. And that's, so tying funding and outcomes together is a very, very important aspect of it. Uh, Miso layer, population segmentation. So actually starting to take our population and group them into, into, into segments of people with similar care needs. So we might have a segment of, of, of elderly vulnerable people, a segment of people with very high uh, lifestyle risk factors for things like uh, uh, diabetes and hypertension. So actually trying to put people into groups based on their care needs and how often they'll need that care. And risk stratification within those uh, within those segments, using the data to work out who's most at risk of a poor outcome. So with those two things together, that's really predictive analytics. So using the data to predict what segment somebody should be in and how risky they are of a negative outcome in that segment. And then targeted strategies, as we've seen with, with uh, Kaiser Permanente, prescriptive analytics. So saying from the data, what is the intervention that's going to work for my individual and starting to apply that rather than trying to do this global one size fits all. And at a micro level, it needs integrated health records. We need to be able to share information across the community and we need accurate coded data going exactly back to the point that was being made yesterday. There's no point in just having narrative text here. We need to be able to do the analysis. And that integrated health record, that, that joined up EHR is absolutely paramount, as is uh, as are other technology things that we'll come on to. Scaling up of primary care services, absolutely paramount. I think this is probably one of the most important, if not the most important aspect of this, is to scale up primary care. And by scaling up primary care, I don't necessarily just mean building new primary care centres or increasing the volume of places that are there. Scaling up can be very different. Scaling up is increasing integration, increasing uh, capacity building, changing and diversifying maybe the funding and management arrangements to make um, a more robust uh, primary care system. So it might be that the scaling up is that we want to build some smoking cessation clinics. We want to hook them up via electronic health records with the, with the primary care centres. We want to enable a referral process so a, a GP can refer to that clinic if they, if they think it's very important that, the, that that person moves away from smoking. And that, that it may be funded through a public health programme. So scaling up is, is, is not just about building new things. It's about changing and, and expanding our capacity. And patient empowerment. I'm not going to talk about patient empowerment uh, because Professor Al Barak will talk about that later and will be far more eloquent than I. Um, and if you just look at those things, if you look at everything there, it's about data, it's about information, it's about technology, and it's about people. So building population health systems, which is the emerging trend across the world in how we tackle this problem, is absolutely built on informatics. It's absolutely fundamental that informaticians are right at the heart of this. Finally, I just want to give you some examples. So this, this is every... Every care setting in the UK, the big red blob in the middle is London, and you can see some of the, the other bigger cities, such as Manchester, as you, as you go further up the graph. So every single dot there is a, is a care service, a hospital, uh, a care home, a GP practice, a community unit, but the vast majority of those are primary care services, so they are not services where people are in hospital. And at TPP, I think, so TPP is an example. We provide most of the primary care services um, the electronic health record across the country. And our philosophy, we've been, we've been doing this for about 18 years in the UK, and our philosophy has always been around one patient, one record, which we should probably be shifting towards one citizen, one record in this uh, arena where we're trying to stop people become pa becoming patients. We're trying to keep them out of healthcare settings. And the point is that no matter where the patient presents, it's a central hosted solution, so no matter where the patient presents, that information is available, and that everybody involved in that patient's care, including the patient themselves, contributes to that central community record. It really is their default electronic health record across the country. What that means for, the, for this graph is that all of those nodes across primary care are connected. They're connected from information flows, and that means that patient data flows between all those places if the patient turns up and needs to present uh, for care, and it means also further than that. It means that uh, data entry templates, that clinical decision support, the uh, analytic reports that people generate inside the system, they can share with other people in the system. So we're passing clinical content around as well as patient information. And it's, it's, it's a fascinating environment. It's created a fascinating infrastructure for, for, for innovation, as we'll, we'll see shortly. 
And from an academic and a scientific point of view, the, the, the language of complex adaptive systems is interesting um, for this. So what that network starts to look like is what, uh, if you're involved in network theory and complex adaptive systems, which really are interesting for healthcare, would be a scale-free network. And the scale-free network looks like the World Wide Web. Um, what a scale-free network means is, is that we've got some, it's not like the road network, it's more like the airport network. So we've got a lot of nodes, a lot of those sensors have got a few links to other places. Yes, the patient information can flow around all of them, but what we'll find is that GPs in a locality work very closely with other GPs. So primary care centres working closely together in terms of what, what patients they're treating, um, what templates they're using, their standardised decision support, what they need to work to do for their population. And then there are some other bigger, slightly bigger sites, some polyclinics um, doing community services who will take data and take patients from a lot of those services. And then right at the top of the tree, we've got acute hospitals who have links into hundreds and hundreds of these practices. So we've got this really diverse network with some hubs with lots and lots of links and a lot of hubs with a few links between them being very, very flexible and very adaptive. And what those kind of networks are really important for scaling up healthcare services because they give us some interesting things. And one of those things is emergent behaviour. And it's a, it's a, a fancy term for nothing for, from a healthcare perspective. It gives us best practice. So people, when people design new ways of working, they design a new report, they design some new decision support, it naturally filters through that network and other people start to use it. So we're diffusing that clinical, that clinical innovation, that clinical knowledge, and it just happens organically. We have phase transitions, again, it's a fancy word for really saying system champions. So people who are driven and committed to making, let's say, child health better in an area or the real focus on, on, on uh, TB and the problems that that started to cause and pushing in an area really, really hard and everybody around them rallies around because they're sharing the same information. They can see those patient records, they can see those clinical tools. And interestingly, feedback. So, and, and really interesting studies recently about uh, how a patient interacts with, their, with the community and with the setting they're in. So if you drop a patient into a certain area with certain primary care services, what does that do to the patient's health care? What, what change does that make based on what services are on the ground? And then as patients start to get empowered and there start to be groups, them, how does that impact the community? So it's an evolving system which is really, really interesting. And we're starting to see some very, very interesting uh, management and, and, and models of care results from. I have to have a nod to technology, um, if not just for my friend in, in Heathrow who I was chatting to. Um, that network, the, the idea of information networks and sharing information in connected EHRs is absolutely vital to what we do in the future, but so is technology. And for all of you working in mobile health, working in social media, working in EHRs and cloud computing, anything to do with, with scaling up um, uh, our technical ability, big data, Hadoop, these kinds of technologies, or anything to do with miniaturization, uh, you have Moore's law to thank. So this is uh, George Moore working for Intel in 1965 made the prediction that we'd stick double the number of transistors on every integrated circuit every two years and that has pretty much stayed true forever. And this means that we have started, uh, we can get smaller and smaller applications with more and more power, enabling things like patient empowerment. Um, if you look there in 1970, if you scaled that up, this is on a log scale, so in 1970, if our transistor was a two-storey house, that house is now about 35 times the size of Mount Everest. That progress has been absolutely remarkable. And I go back to my first point. Technology is not healthcare informatics, but we should absolutely exploit it for all of our health, healthcare informatics needs whenever we can. So two examples from the UK, and then I am finished. So the first one's around that network. Um, this is uh, an emerging behaviour. We saw a best practice um, programme, which we didn't invent. It just happened organically and started to spread. And the idea was that a group of GPs in the locality didn't want to send patients to hospital for referrals anymore if they could avoid it. They wanted to stop uh, the, the, the vehicle of transfer into hospital being the patient and move it to be the electronic record. And because they've got those information links, they could do that. So they did what we would call e-consults. So the GP, instead of referring the patient, just refers the record and the consultant at the other end within two or three days, because they, they like to work that way, it works very nicely, reviews that record and sends the advice back to the GP. It means the patient doesn't have to transfer to hospital. It's really important if we've got a vulnerable elderly patient for which that transfer to hospital can be a catastrophic event in their healthcare. And it also means that there's an enormous drop off in terms of uh, the expense for the hospital in terms of doing those referrals. We've freed up some capacity there. And if you look, has it spread throughout? Yes, 90% of GP practices have taken that on board because it's been working. It's emerged through the network. And has it been successful? 31% of all cardiology referrals now happen virtually. Uh, it's an enormous saving for us, and it's a really good use of technology. 
And then more towards the data side is some work we've done with the NHS and some of the leading universities uh, in the UK. And we wanted to, we were sitting on that population level data. And one of our groups of interest, so one of those segmentation pieces, are the vulnerable elderly in the UK. We have a, a lot of old people and it started to really impact on our health economy because they're hitting hospital hard. And we want to try and use a population health approach to, to treat those people and to get interventions in place to stop that happening. And we're sitting on a database of, uh, we've got 40 million records in the UK. So we're sitting on that database, research database, and we wanted to do something. And what we developed was a way of scoring the patient, giving them a frailty index, so a, a score really between 0 and 1, as to how vulnerable they were, based on the clinical, social, um, and financial factors we could draw from the record. So taking a really broad uh, base, it looks at about three or 4,000 codes, it looks at the medication, it looks at the blood test results, um, it looks at their social care data, and it comes out with this score. And what we've found is that it tracks beautifully against, this is against mortality, but actually the graphs are the same for care, home admission, or for unplanned admission into hospital. So we can see, and it's kind of small, I apologise, but on the left-hand side, the green line is the fit, the, the fit people, the, the people that the, the record identifies as not having a, a severe frail condition, and then yellow, orange, and red, that's so, uh, frailty is getting much more severe. So if you see there on the red line, if someone's in that category of frailty, then there's almost a 75% chance they will die within five years, which does make a difference to how you plan for their care and how they get the best patient experience and the best outcome, um, and it probably isn't hospital. So it stopped us having to do comprehensive geriatric assessments um, in certain areas. It's at least allowed us to target the people where we should try and get those care packages in place. And then we built it back into the system, and I know there was some talk yesterday about open source and, and, and um, how that can stifle innovation if you're not in an open source arena. And, and, and Moafa made the point that there's, there's a, a middle ground, and I would absolutely echo that. So our approach has always been that we need to build the system in a flexible way so people can innovate, they can build in their decision support, they can build in the components they need, but not necessarily with, with being able to code because maybe you don't need that. So we've given people the ability to build that tool into the system and use it in whatever way they want. And we've just seen how interesting it's been because those communities have done the thing that's interesting to them. And I'll just pick a couple. So targeted medication reviews. Um, so we have a problem where lots of people, once they get to the age of 80, for example, are very polypharmic, they're on lots and lots of medications, and how do we solve that problem? Um, and it's difficult to just walk around the community and, and, and ask people, but actually by using the frailty index um, that we developed, so looking for the vulnerable people alongside their medication data, has pinpointed exactly the people that we need to start changing their medication because they're the people who are about to potentially have an adverse, uh, it'll have an adverse effect on their health because they're not on the right regime. And falls prevention. So there's a falls prevention uh, program that started because, of course, falls are terrible and you, you end up, uh, elderly people end up with severe health, health needs in hospital, trans, uh, maybe a hip transplant, for example, hip replacement, sorry. Um, and what we've seen there is it goes back to the first things we were saying, it's not necessarily the clinical intervention. So with falls prevention, that team are using that data, that population level data, to look at the people at risk of falls and going to their house and doing an assessment. And often it's just the lack of a handrail or it's the lack of a walk-in shower, it's not the clinical intervention that they need, so it's been really, really interesting. And finally, to the Kingdom, so as I said, we've been working here for about three years closely with the Ministry of Health, and uh, there is, uh, and part of the National eHealth strategy is to scale up primary care, it is to put a primary care IT system in, and it is really a wonderful canvas on which to start this. And the question came um, yesterday from the over there on the left-hand side of the room, which was, how do we catch up with Europe? How do we, how do we start to, to catch up with what's going on uh, in the UK and the, and, and the Western world? And I, I think the answer is that you don't need to. I think you should be learning the lessons that we have learnt. Um, you should be looking at the mistakes we've made and starting from where we are now, which we've made some, some mistakes in terms of health informatics and technology, and starting with a, a brilliant canvas on which to work. And actually looking to leapfrog as, as soon as possible in terms of how you can deliver that care. The one thing that I absolutely and utterly know is true, that whatever we're doing to treat those two problems we've talked about, it's going to need information and data, it's going to need technology, and it's going to need people to do it. So it's going to need informaticians to push us into the, the next generation of healthcare, and it's going to need the people in this room to help drive that through. And with that, thank you very much.